Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this EU Green Week session. Space is the place, monitoring the planet's health with Copernicus. It's been organized by the European Commission's DG DEFIS, Directorate General Defence, Industry and Space, and DG JRC, the Directorate General Joint Research Centre. My name is Karen Coleman. I'm a journalist and a broadcaster from Ireland, and it's my pleasure to be the moderator of today's session. And just to give you a little bit of background to it, I'm sure you know EU Green Week 2021 marks the launch of the newly adopted action plan of the European Commission's towards a zero pollution ambition for air, water and soil, building a healthier planet for healthier people. And one instrument that can help to achieve that zero pollution goal is Copernicus, the European Commission's Earth Observation Programme. It provides Europe with a continuous, independent and reliable access to satellite Earth observation data and information. Millions of gigabytes of global data from satellites and ground-based airborne and seaborne measurement systems provide free and openly accessible information to help service providers, public authorities and other international organisations improve citizens' quality of life. So during this session, we're going to find out how Copernicus can help to identify sources of pollution at sea, on land, rivers, lakes and in our atmosphere so that successful steps can be taken to clean up our planet. Now, in a moment, we're going to hear from Matthew Spechke, the Director for Space at the European Commission's Directorate General for Defence, Industry and Space. And then we're going to have a panel debate with five speakers. We're going to hear from them all individually first, and then hopefully we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes to take your questions, which I will be putting to them. And if you haven't attended some of the previous sessions for EU Green Week, then in order for you to be able to submit a question, can you go on to the online platform sly.do, sli.do, and then you put in the password, which is EU Green Week 2021. I think the hashtag will already be there, but it's capital EU, capital G, capital W. So EU Green Week 2021, then choose our session, which is 4.4. And then you can put your questions in there. And then when we get to the Q&A segment, after we've heard from each of our panelists, I will put your questions to them. And that's really the only bit of housekeeping issue that I have for you today. And we have a packed agenda. So let's get going. And I'd now like to introduce Matthew Spechke, the Director for Space at the European Commission's Directorate General for Defence Industry and Space, DEFIS. He's held that position since the beginning of 2020, and it includes space policy, satellite navigation, and Earth observation. Matthews, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karen. Good afternoon to all of you. It's a pleasure to open this session. And um, let's go immediately into the substance. The reason month have been exciting ones with a new landscape of policy supporting our Commission priorities and in particular the European Green Deal. And the newest entry, you've just mentioned it, Karen, uh, just last week is the uh, EU action plan towards zero pollution for air, water and soil. Zero pollution is a cross-cutting objective, also contributing to the uh, UN uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And here the ambition is to prevent pollution at the source or uh, minimize it. Uh, however, one cannot manage what one cannot measure. Europe, through its Copernicus Earth Observation Program, is the largest space data provider in the world. Copernicus makes available petabytes of global data from satellites, and you've mentioned it, uh, also integrated with ground-based airborne and seaborne measurement systems. And with Copernicus, we are providing free and openly accessible, actionable information to help service providers, public authorities, and also international organizations to improve our quality of life and beyond. Um, Copernicus products are at the heart of the implementation of many policies. I just mentioned some of them, and maybe uh, there will be further 
um, input on these um, afterwards in the in the panel session. The common agricultural policy, environmental policy at large, uh, our marine strategy, uh, the water framework directive, our biodiversity strategy, the habitats directive, really uh, a lot we are doing and where we are contributing uh, with, uh, with Copernicus. And our data cover uh, not only years, but already decades at relevant temporal and spatial res resolution. And they allow us to detect changes, to establish trends, and they can be used to model the future uh, under different uh, scenarios. And this allows us to make informed decisions. That's what our policy is all about, taking informed decisions, uh, decisions about where to go, and how to best reach zero pollution reduction targets by testing scenarios, by uh, testing intervention options, and uh, then hopefully also by uh, assisting us in choosing the most effective solution. The hour we are now spending together will give us the possibility to better understand what in concrete terms Copernicus data offers to us and to fully appreciate what a powerful ally Copernicus can be in monitoring the pollution on land and in the sea and the air. Thank you very much and back to you, Karen. Thank you very much, uh, Matthews. Now, you're very welcome if you're just joining us. I'm Karen Coleman. I'm a journalist and a broadcaster from Ireland, and I'm moderating this afternoon's session. Now it's time to hear from our panellists, and we're going to hear from each one of them initially, and then, if they stick to their allocated time, we should have between 10 to 15 minutes towards the end uh, for a question and answer session. And again, that's where we'd love to hear from you Put your questions through the Slido app, the online app, go to sli.do and put the password in EU Green Week 2021 and choose our session, which is 4.4. Now, as I said, we're going to go to each one of our speakers individually. And it's my pleasure now to invite our first panelist to our virtual stage. Hans Brunings is the executive director of the European Environmental Agency. He took office at the EEA in June 2013, and his academic expertise lies primarily in the field of European and international environmental policy, studying the effects of globalization on the global governance of environmental issues and sustainable development. Hans, you're very welcome. I'm actually going to put an opening question to you. We're going to, here really to talk about Copernicus. So from your perspective, how do you think Copernicus can help to monitor pollution on land so that successful steps can be taken to clean up our planet? Thanks, Karen. And it's a pleasure to be in this session with the, the two key commission services that we collaborate with so well under the Copernicus program, of course. Well, I, I think, first of all, the, the very high ambition of the zero pollution program is dovetailed by the very high ambition of the Copernicus program. And what uh, the zero pollution uh, package requires is a much stronger integration of policies that have for the most part been developing next to each other or in bubbles, as some people would say. Uh, and that requires also more integrated data, understanding, uh, monitoring and reporting. And of course, that is one of the strengths of the Copernicus program. So we will be much better able to monitor air, water, soil pollution through the land monitoring service and the other services that we'll be speaking later on in the program. And we will be able, indeed, as Matthias also said, to monitor the sources of pollution, but also the impacts of hopefully successful policy integration under zero pollution. And that includes the impacts on environment and ecosystems on land, but also the impacts on human health in terms of the spatial determinants of uh, human health. And I can give a couple of examples, land and soil degradation, uh, which are impacted by pollution. Well, that is a core component of the land monitoring uh, service. Huh? We will also be able to look at uh, goals that are very concrete, like 25% uh, reduction in ecosystems that are threatened by air pollution. We can monitor that. We can uh, be assisting in precision farming. 
that could lead to a much lower use of pesticides and nutrient pollution. All of those elements are possible with Copernicus. And, and then we could go on with forest degradation, but also the positive elements, the increase of green spaces in our cities that can be a part of uh, trying to abate uh, pollution and have a positive impact on human health. So there are many, many uh, potential applications. Now, in order to, to really reap the benefits for those, I think there are a couple of conditions. One is that we need to combine Copernicus data with other data, in situ data, data from other sources. And that is exactly what, what we are uh, facilitating also at the EEA. We will also, of course, need to make sense of the data. So joint investments with the JRC and with other partners in data intelligence uh, methodologies to do this big data artificial intelligence methods. And then involving the member states, because if it needs to serve policies, the policy implementation is usually at the member state level or at city level. So connecting to the real users of the information is important and that requires strong partnerships partnerships between entrusted entities partnerships with uh, the european space agency in our case also very strongly on the land component with the jrc but also with the user community and with the communities that deliver these other sources of data so we have a fantastic uh, new tool with high ambitions in our hands uh, so the task now is to make the very best use to serve this uh, very ambitious agenda of zero pollution. And we are absolutely committed to be a collaborative uh, and strong partner in that undertaking. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hans. And if you do have questions for Hans, uh, then please put them in through the Slido app and we'll get to them a little bit later. Now I want to turn to our next speaker. Dr. Vincent-Henri Pouc is the director of the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service, CAMS, and he is the Deputy Director for Copernicus Services at ECMWF, which implements CAMS and the Copernicus Climate Change Service, C3S, on behalf of the European Commission. Vincent Henri is an internationally respected scientist on atmospheric environmental issues and he's co-authored 80 peer-reviewed publications. He serves on a number of international scientific and advisory committees, including the European Environment Agency and the World Meteorological Organization. Vincent Henri, you're very welcome to EU Green Week. And as a specialist in the monitoring of the atmosphere, how do you think Copernicus can help to reduce pollution on the planet? Good afternoon, Karen. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I've prepared a, a short video to explain uh, why it is so important to monitor air pollution and what we have been able to achieve with the uh, Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service over the last few years. So could you play the, the video about air pollution? Thank you. Nothing is more natural to us than breathing. Every day we take in around 10,000 litres of air enough to fill about 4,000 balloons. But with every breath we take, we're also inhaling invisible and harmful pollutants. For instance, fine particle matter, which is less than 2.5 micrometers in diameter, can have a harmful effect on our health by penetrating deep into our lungs. This can include heart disease and long-term illnesses such as asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, lung cancer, and even dementia. Pollution is the number one environmental cause of death in the EU. Over 400,000 of our citizens die prematurely each year and millions more suffer debilitating illness requiring medication and hospitalization. This has an enormous human and economic cost. But positive action is being taken. The European Green Deal is a commitment to carbon neutrality and a zero pollution environment, supporting national efforts to improve the quality of our air. The problem with air pollutants is that instead of sinking to the ground, they are transported by winds, making it an issue which is not only local, but also regional and worldwide. <laughs> to fight air pollution and better protect citizens, we must monitor the composition of the atmosphere and accurately measure harmful pollutants, which puts Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service, CAMS for short, at the forefront of supporting efforts to clean up our air daily. 
CAMS combines millions of satellite and non-satellite observations with computer models of the atmosphere, just like for the weather forecasts. There are very few such systems in the world capable of providing timely and accurate information on major pollutants, together with predictions on how their concentrations may evolve over coming days. CAMS information serves a wide range of downstream services, such as TV bulletins, national air quality forecasts, smartphone applications, and policy tools. CAMS already reaches tens of millions of people every day, from individuals to experts to business and political leaders. The faster we act, the better we ensure measures are implemented, the more chance we give the planet and most uh, of all ourselves room to breathe again. Environmental monitoring can help us make smarter decisions for a more sustainable future. This includes changing the way we live by working towards reducing emissions of pollutants from all sectors. And the choices we make today, which determine the quality of air we breathe tomorrow, have never been so important. Because after all, breathing is not optional. So, Vincent Henri, do you have anything else to add, or um, do you want to wait till we go back to you the second time? Just a little bit to say that it's a not so frequent example of uh, worldwide leadership for, for Europe. And with our satellites, and especially uh, Sentinel 5 precursor in that case, our in situ observations and our modeling, uh, we uh, have made it collectively in the Copernicus program. And now uh, Copernicus information is flowing into applications, websites, all, all over the world. Air pollution is a big problem in Europe, but it's also a big problem in the world. And in some countries, uh, the first uh, information about air quality actually came through Copernicus over the last few, few, few uh, years. So uh, yes, and uh, as uh, uh, Matthias Petschke was saying, one can only really ma manage what one can measure. And that's ex exactly that. Uh, measuring air pollution is the first step towards addressing the problem. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Vincent Henri, and we'll be going back to you for the second part of your presentation a little bit later. Now to our next panelist. Laurence Cronier is the head of the Market and Service Department at Mercator Ocean International, which delivers the Copernicus Marine Service for the European Commission. Dr. Cronier's role is to strengthen the Copernicus Marine data uptake by users through better service and marketing, training and communications activities. Um, Laurence, we've heard about Copernicus's role in monitoring pollution on land and in the atmosphere. What about our seas and our oceans, some of which are heavily polluted? What can Copernicus do to help reduce that pollution? Thank you, Karen. Hi, everyone. Very happy to be here. So uh, indeed, the, the Copernicus program and especially the Copernicus Marine Service is one of the link uh, within the full value chain towards zero marine pollution. It really provides uh, with Green Deal solution uh, to combat uh, zero, uh, zero pollution. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so the, the Copernicus Marine Service is, uh, I'm sorry, but uh, I can't see very well the slides, but uh, so, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to manage without that. Um, so the, the, the Copernicus Marine Service is a free of charge service. It is available uh, to uh, any users free of charge. It is also a user-driven service, meaning that we really uh, make sure that uh, the offer is evolving to be fit for purpose for the user demand. Uh, it is also a sustained service. This is very important. It really means that the data that we provide today is really gonna be provided still within the next years. And the data which is being updated daily today is, is still gonna be updated today for the next, every day for the next seven years. So this is a service which is available uh, within one single portal at the marine.copernicus.eu uh, URL. So this service is providing with data, with ocean data. 
it is uh, monitoring the blue, the white, and the green ocean. So wh what do we mean by the blue, the white, and green ocean? So the blue ocean is about the ocean dynamics. It's talking about ocean currents, ocean temperature, ocean salinity, for example, or sea level rise. Uh, the white ocean is everything about the sea ice. It could be sea ice concentration. It could be iceberg density, for example, in the Arctic, in the Antarctic, but also in the Baltic Sea. And finally, the green ocean is everything about the biogeochemistry within the ocean with parameters such as uh, dissolved oxygen, nutrients, uh, pH, and acidity, but also plankton, could be zooplankton and phytoplankton. So a lot of parameters are being provided through uh, the, the Copernicus Marine Service. And this data is coming from three sources. It's, it's coming from satellite data, in situ, and models, ocean models. So really, the satellite data is providing with the monitoring of the ocean at the surface in the past for the last 25 years up to today. When in situ observation really provide with uh, um, a discrete description of what's happening within the top uh, 2,000 meters of the ocean, still uh, for the last 25 years up to today. And we also have models, and those models really allow us to have the four-dimensional view of the ocean from the bottom up to the surface. In the past, for, for the last 25 years again, up to 10-day forecast, because the, the models really allow to provide with a forecast capacity uh, for the next 10 days. And so finally, the, the Copernicus Marine Service is really a tool to support a sustainable blue economy, to support uh, implementation of policies. So it's really a key tool that is allowing to monitor the water quality everywhere in the ocean, in the global ocean, but also in European seas. It is a key tool which is supporting the combat uh, against pollution, such as oil pollution. It could be uh, harmful noxious substances. It could be sargassum algae pollutions as well, and many other pollution. And also, it is a key tool uh, which supports the implementation of European directives uh, at member states level. So, this is it for the Copernicus Marine Service. Thank you. Back to you, Karen. Thank you very much, uh, Laurence. Um, and now we turn to our next guest. Stuart Crane is the Global Coordinator on the SDG6 Integrated Monitoring Program at the United Nations Environment Program. And Stuart has worked for the UN for the last 10 years, supporting governments with managing ecosystems and the impacts of climate change. Um, he's currently working as the Global Coordinator on the SDG6 Integrated Monitoring Program at the United Nations Environment Program. Stuart, you're very welcome to EU Green Week and to this session. From your perspective then, how do you see Copernicus contributing to pollution reduction on inland surface water bodies such as rivers and lakes? Yes, thanks Karen and, uh, and good afternoon to everyone. Um, well, to help monitor pollution in uh, freshwater bodies, and these are our large lakes, as you mentioned, that we use for drinking water, um, that are a source of freshwater fish for millions of people. The European Commission, through its Copernicus Land Service and the Joint Research Centre, has teamed up with the United Nations Environment Programme to monitor lake water quality across the entire planet. And we now have for the first time an assessment of water quality within all large lakes in the world using satellite imagery to generate statistics on water quality and this data is freely available and it's on the freshwater ecosystem explorer and the motivation for developing this geospatial site with water pollution information is so that we can help every country in the world understand the state of their freshwater ecosystems how water quality within these freshwater ecosystems is changing over time and therefore provide countries 
with the information they need to make progress towards sustainable development goal target 66 and this is the target which countries um, are working towards to protect and restore their freshwater ecosystems including our lakes and i would encourage those listening to go and check out the site for themselves the url is sdg661.app and when you enter this water data platform, you can find a range of information about different types of freshwater ecosystem with lakes being one of them. And we have data available on nearly 4,300 um, of the world's large lakes. And what's great about monitoring freshwater from space is that we're not just providing a static snapshot, but we're looking back in time and we can therefore compare recent conditions, such as the most recent three years, with a historical reference period. Um, so the lake statistics we're generating from the satellite imagery, we use a five-year reference period. We assess uh, every 30 meter pixel of a lake every month for that five-year period. And then we can compare that same pixel in the same location with re recent data series. And so in this manner, we're generating a water quality story over time and well into the future. So what water quality parameters can we monitor? Well, there's two that we're really interested in and can be monitored using uh, satellite data provided from Copernicus. One is turbidity, and that's a measure of water cloudiness and high turbidity can indicate water pollution in lakes because when you have large volumes of suspended particles, it provides attachment for pollutants such as metals and bacteria and lakes with high turbidity can adversely impact human health and ecosystem health. And recently, um, UNEP actually carried out a study of around half of these large lakes in the world, around 2,000 of them. And what we found is that nearly a quarter of those, that sample size, were found to have high to extreme turbidity readings just during 2019. And the image you can see on the screen here shows some large lakes in Central and Eastern Africa. And you can see where you have the orange, yellow and red. This is where we have high and extreme recordings of turbidity in our large lakes. And the other parameter that we can measure is trophic state. And you might be familiar with the term eutrophication. Uh, this is essentially what we're monitoring. Trophic state is the degree of um, organic matter which accumulates in water. And this matters because organic matter enters lakes from waste, untreated wastewater. Um, from agricultural runoff, from nitrogen, from phosphorus and fertilizer, and it leads to the growth of harmful algal blooms. And these high trophic conditions um, are, are harmful because they effectively starve lakes of oxygen. And so what the Copernicus Lake Water Quality products give us is access to these two parameters. And UNEP is able to then convey this information to countries and inform them how many affected lakes each country may have. And what's really important when we're providing water quality data to water managers and to decision makers is that we allow them to interrogate the data themselves. And this graph represents lake water data in just one country. And it's just an illustration that we provide countries advanced analysis on the freshwater ecosystem explorer, enabling them to better understand, hopefully to act upon um, monthly changes in water quality so that they can see where specific, in a specific period of the year uh, their lakes are experiencing changes in water quality. And as I mentioned earlier, all the information is freely available, it's accessible, it's downloadable to all interested users. And this is how Copernicus is helping countries to monitor their water pollution. Karen, that's it from me. Thanks. Back to you. Great. Thank you very much, Stuart. And if you have questions for Stuart or indeed any other of the panellists, don't forget you can put them through the Slido app online and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible. Um, now, so our final panellist, but not our last speaker, is Anna Abascal, a senior researcher at IH Cantabria, where she leads the area of expertise on oil spills and accidental marine pollution. Anna graduated with a PhD in marine science and technology from the University of Cantabria in 2009. Anna, we know how damaging oil spills and accidental marine pollution can be and the devastating impact they can have on the marine environment. So can you tell us how you see Copernicus playing a role in reducing those kinds of harmful incidents? And 
Yes, yes. Ah. <laughs> yes. I think you were muted. Okay, good. Yes, <laughs> it was. Uh, thank you, Karen. Yes, uh, I think that Copernicus plays an important role in the protection of the marine environment because it provides us with the data that we need to combat marine pollution. Since I, I can see my present, ah, yes, it's, it's, it's fine. <laughs> Thanks to the data provided by Copernicus, we can uh, develop uh, downstream services, we can develop coastal applications, and we can provide to the end users with the information that they need to respond in case of accidental pollu pollution, for example. To show the benefits of Coper Copernicus, I'm going to talk about two systems, Atenea and Sigma, that we have developed for oil and chemical spills in three coastal refineries located in Spain. Then the objective of the system is to prevent the pollution and to provide to the oil company the information that they need in case of accidental release. Then Copernicus, and especially Copernicus Marine Service, is an important piece for the development of these services because it provides us with all the data that we need to run our models and finally to support decision making. Then, in general, we use uh, a lot of products from Copernicus. Uh, many of the products uh, mentioned by Lawrence in her previous presentation. For example, we use satellite uh, images for monitoring the pollution. We use in situ measurements for the validation of the models. And the most uh, important source of information for us is the data provided by numerical models, the marine variables obtained with uh, ocean computation. We use the forecast system to predict in real time the evolution of the oil spills. And we also use the hindcast data, several years, uh, decades of data of marine variables to calculate the hazard and to assess the risk for the coastal and the marine environment. Uh, then I'm going to show uh, some examples of the products that we use in our systems. For example, regarding sensors, we use uh, satellite images for monitoring the pollution. We provide in real time this information to help end users to, to respond in case of accident. In this slide, slide, for example, you can see the visualization of an uh, image from Sentinel-2 uh, in Algeciras Bay. We are currently we are working with uh, Sentinel-2, but in the future we plan to incorporate other sensors such as Sentinel-1 or Sentinel-5. In case of accidental release, an important component of, of our systems is to predict in real time the evolution of the pollutant. If there is an accident, we provide the forecast of the transport, the dispersion, and the fate of the oil or the chemical spill. Then again, if we want to simulate to forecast the evolution of the oil spill, we need also the forecast of the currents that controls the behavior of the, of the pollutant. Then again, Copernicus, and especially Copernicus Marine Service, and also uh, national providers by as Puerto del Estado in the, in the case of Spain, uh, are important pieces for the development of these systems. Uh, at uh, offshore facilities, for example, we use uh, directly the forecast currents provided by the EV forecast system from Copernicus, but in coastal areas, for example, in this case in Algeciras Bay, we need to nest uh, local hydrodynamic models to Copernicus to obtain the high resolution currents that we need inside the bay. Then in this uh, slide, you can see, for example, on the left, uh, an example of uh, of high resolution currents in Argentina's Bay, provided by Puertos del Estado. You can also see the, uh, the simulation of the oil spill, that is the final information that we provide to the decision makers to help them to control the pollution. And finally, uh, we use also the data provided by Copernicus to prevent the accidents. The, uh, the ocean data provided by the EV forecast system and also the ocean data provided by the model nested to, Col to Copernicus, we use this data in real time to provide operability conditions for loading and unloading operations. Then we provide warning criteria that indicate if the operations are safe or not. Then if there is a risk in the operation, then our system provides recommended measures to reduce red the risk and to increase the security in the operations. Then this is the general review of uh, how we use Copernicus data for oil and chemical spills. And I would like to conclude uh, highlighting again the relevance of Copernicus for the development of these uh, uh, downstream services. Many thanks.
Thank you very much, Anna. Now, let's go back to Vincent Henri Pouc, uh, Director of the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service, CAMS, and the Deputy Director for Copernicus Services at ECMWF. It implements CAMS and the Copernicus Climate Change Service on behalf of the European Commission. Um, so, Vincent Henri, we already heard about atmospheric monitoring. Um, let's talk about the ways now Copernicus can potentially monitor CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions. Over to you on that. I think your microphone is off, Vincent Henri, if you just put the Sorry. microphone on. Yeah, it's on Sorry. now. Great. So I, I, I will use uh, also a video to answer this, to start answering this, this question and, and precisely to uh, showcase uh, probably the, the biggest challenge for Copernicus uh, going forward, which is to evaluate uh, CO2 emissions by, by human activities. So can you play the second video, please? Every day, we measure the world around us, starting with the small data of everyday life. We even use our body as a measuring tool to measure time, weight, length, and temperature. But what about the data we can't measure ourselves? Human activities such as the burning of fossil fuels, deforestation, and livestock farming cause carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases to accumulate in the atmosphere. Without it being directly visible to us, these gases have a major impact on our climate. They trap the sun's radiation in the Earth's atmosphere, causing the warming of the Earth's surface. Greenhouse gas emissions have increased steadily since the beginning of the industrial age. 2020 was still one of the hottest years on record, despite the temporary impact of the COVID-19 safety measures that resulted in slightly reduced emissions. 2020 also marks the fifth anniversary of the landmark International Paris Agreement. It aims to combat climate change by ultimately limiting the global temperature increase to between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Although commitments by governments to reach these goals are promising, greater efforts are still needed. To be able to track the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and to assess their consequences for the climate, continuous and precise measurements are necessary. Therefore, we need Earth observation programs and services like Copernicus and its Atmosphere Monitoring Service, CAMS for short, which provides a global view of what's happening around us. Copernicus's monitoring capability provides free and openly accessible data for all. Environmental measures are made through in situ observations at the Earth's surface, collected by monitoring systems that, for instance, are ground, sea, or aircraft based. Using the data provided by the Copernicus services, our impact on climate can be measured and decisions can be made. The Zero Pollution Action Plan is geared to bringing the way we live, produce, and consume within the boundaries that the planet has set. It is difficult to comprehend what is happening on a global scale, especially when it is not directly measurable with our own senses, our own bodies. Therefore, it is important to make the invisible visible. One can only manage what one can measure. Put data to work. So Vincent Henri, do you have anything to add to that before we go to the question and answer session? Maybe just to explain why it is a bigger challenge to measure CO2 than to measure the pollutants, as I've shown already, uh, was, uh, we were doing already very successfully. In fact, uh, for measuring the emission of CO2 by human uh, activity, it's really looking uh, for the proverbial uh, needle in the haystack. The reason is that uh, the emissions by human activity of CO2 is only a tiny fraction compared to the bigger carbon cycle. However, it's because of this tiny imbalance that uh, CO2 and other greenhouse gases accumulate in the atmosphere. And thus, we are looking for a very small quantity in, in a big, bigger pool. And in order to, uh, to, to measure the emissions, we need higher precision. We need to combine the strength of new satellite observation in situ and modeling again. So we'll be using the same recipe as for air pollution, but with a higher degree of precision to deliver this information, which is crucially needed 
to see whether the countries are uh, on their path uh, towards improving and implementing the, the Paris Agreement. Okay, Vincent Henri, thank you so much for that. Now it's time for our question and answer session where I will have the opportunity to put some of the questions that have been coming through the Slido app to our panelists. So I think I'm joined online now by all of our panelists. Um, so let's just see what's been coming through the Slido app. And I think maybe Vincent Henri, I think the first one is for you, but, it, but maybe um, some of the others can answer it as well. So um, I'm going to read it out to you. Will the Copernicus service start systematic projects to monitor climate change hazards and forecast effects on health and a pan-European monitoring service of pollinate or, or, or pollinators and early warning of heat waves will be very beneficial for patients. Will Copernicus prioritize this work? Vincent Henri, I think that's for you. Can you answer that? Yes, yes, of course. In fact, I have a good news because things have already started. Uh, there are a number of projects, uh, in particular as part of the Copernicus Climate Change Service, so-called uh, 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 sectoral information services, looking at different aspects and in particular uh, the health impact of climate change. But let me comment more on the pollen aspect. So the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service has been supporting a number of activities uh, for using uh, our uh, pollen forecast. We provide a daily uh, five days ahead uh, forecast for five of the key pollens. And uh, one of the studies, which was led by the University of Sholai in Lithuania, was to use this information to predict uh, the uh, symptoms that allergic people would, would have. So it's a, it's a collaboration with uh, medical doctors and patients uh, with, with their A fever diaries to try to predict their symptoms with a quite nice uh, success. Uh, another example on pollen, uh, working with the European Euroallergen Network, uh, we are now capable of accessing pollen observation in real time, which is really a breakthrough for bringing uh, pollen information uh, at the same level as air pollution information. So there's lots ongoing, so I really engage uh, the person who uh, asked the question to, to check on the Copernicus website, on the CAMS website, to see uh, all that has been done and to see the new opportunities for uh, moving ahead with uh, some dedicated projects. Very good, very interesting. And Stuart, I think there's another one, um, a question that might be relevant for you. Does the Freshwater Ecosystems Explorer include water quality parameters for other inland water bodies, water courses and transitional water bodies, or is it just for lakes only? Yeah, thanks, Karen, and thanks for the question. Um, currently, it's just for uh, large lakes. We've started with large lakes and we've mapped those globally and water quality parameters for large lakes globally. Um, and that information was actually only released live uh, last year in 2020. But um, the good news is, is that we do plan to move into other water bodies. Currently, those large lakes are captured because we are um, applying the approach to uh, water bodies that are have a resolution of 300 meters by 300 meters um, but the plan is to move into a resolution of 100 meters by 100 meters and therefore we would pick up those same water quality parameters that I mentioned in my earlier intervention for other water bodies so that can be transitional water bodies it can be uh, rivers um, and, or, and or even um, flooded wetland areas so that is the plan for going forward so watch this space and keep an eye on the freshwater ecosystem explorer Okay, great. And when do you think, over what period do you think these will be rolled out? Oh, the plan is hopefully within the next year. Um, yes, the, there is uh, the Copernicus Land Service on water, uh, lake water quality um, ha has a, uh, an intended rollout of, let's say, one to two years. But the, it, there is a slight lag, a slight delay in actually obtaining the satellite data and updating it um, to the site. So, so within the next one to two years. Okay, uh, Hans, a question for you. What do you consider to be the biggest challenge for Copernicus when it comes to contributing to an integrated approach on zero pollution? Well, I think if you want to uh, use the full potential of the Copernicus program, you need to create what I would say is a highly functional Copernicus ecosystem. You need those who are uh, discussing with the engineers what type of instruments will be on the satellites, you need those who can handle the massive amounts of data. You need the modelers, the scenario builders, 
you need those who understand how to integrate Copernicus data with the traditional in situ data and other new forms of monitoring like citizen science, Internet of Things type uh, elements. And then you need those who can integrate this into the traditional policy support systems. So you need a functional ecosystem that integrates the Copernicus potential at the fullest and that across a variety of levels of intervention from the urban level to the national level, the European and in some of the examples we've seen the global level. And that sounds easy, but it requires an investment. It requires really a network approach that, uh, that is a sort of specialty of its own. Uh, and, and that is one of the elements on which we uh, as an agency want to contribute because we have that link with the countries. We have the link with the data handlers. We, we know what the policies are about. And so having that functional uh, ecosystem I think is a challenge, but also it, it's a phenomenal opportunity to bring together people who have been often working in silos until uh, rather recently. So that I would say that. Can you give us an idea of the kinds of people, organizations, bodies that could potentially come together for that networking approach that you talk about? Yeah, I think the, the first uh, question for Vincent Henri was a good example. Huh? The, the link between uh, health and climate change. Of course, Copernicus can contribute there through heat wave predictions and a number of other things that he talked about. But we've got a whole host of other uh, data information modeling uh, scenarios around the link between environment, climate and health. And we have set up uh, quite recently with a number of others uh, a service called uh, Climate and Health Observatory. And the goal is not to have that in parallel with Copernicus. The goal is, of course, to integrate the, the Copernicus knowledge on that type of platforms. And that requires uh, yeah, setting up a functional network, investing in it, making sure that the data can be transferred and can be integrated and that we can make sense of it. So the, the health climate nexus would be an excellent example of that, I think. Uh, Vincent Henri, do you, you maybe want to come back and comment on that? Is is that possible, or, or what kind of an effort is it going to take to you know to have that kind of cooperation? It sounds fantastic. Is it is it possible? What's needed for it to to materialize? No, I, I think the uh, in the design of Copernicus, the uh, open, free data policy is really crucial. So, as uh, Hans was mentioning, it's a matter of networking uh, and, and and making sure that the data flow. Uh, coming from, from the in-situ observations, coming from the models, coming from the satellites, are made available to, to platforms like the uh, Climate and Health Observatory that he, uh, Hans was, uh, was, was mentioning. So I think uh, we, we're in a, in a phase now where uh, uh, data flows uh, can be much faster than they were in the past. Exchange of data can be much faster because there have been a lot of lessons learned, in particular in terms of interoperability. And when we develop our Copernicus services, uh, interoperability of the data is, is really pivotal because we want to make it available also for new technologies like artificial intelligence, machine learning. And if we're doing that, things have to be properly labeled, properly accessible. And, and yeah, that's, uh, I would say, a by design uh, element of, uh, of Copernicus that enables this, uh, the, the such, uh, such platform as, uh, as Hans was, uh, was just mentioning. Brilliant. And, and let's maybe go to uh, you, Laurence, and, and the marine element. Again, maybe, you know, bearing in mind what has just been said, what policies do you think will benefit from the support of the Copernicus Marine Service data to fight pollution? So uh, as far as the ocean is concerned, there are many, many policies that uh, benefit from the Copernicus marine data. I mean, the major one is the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, which is already benefiting from Copernicus data. I mean, some of the member states, if not all of the member states, are using the data uh, for uh, to monitor the descriptor about eutrophication, for example. I mean, the Marine Strategy Framework Directive has 11 descriptors to monitor the water quality uh, at the coast. And one of them is about the eutrophication. And for this, you need 
in situ satellite and model data, which is provided by the, the Copernicus Marine Service. So marine strategy framework directive is one of them, but it could also be water framework directive, basing water directive as well. Uh, all those directives do yet benefit or will benefit from Copernicus in the future. And uh, they also feed on Copernicus in order to evolve in the future, actually, because all of those directives, they are going to be updated uh, within the next few years. And they do come to us and ask us, what can you, as Copernicus, what can you provide to us so that we update our directives to better fit uh, the monitoring of the, the, the planet and, and, and the ocean? So it comes two ways. I mean, we do provide them with data, but we also help them to evolve and have a better uh, directive in the future. Okay, uh, very good. And maybe sticking with marine, but in a different sense, in terms of the oil spillages. Anna, your presentation, you know, was was really good. And you presented an operational tool for decision making in case of oil or chemical spills. But what do you think are the key aspects for a su successful application of these types of tools? Yes, uh, I think that the, uh, the key aspect for the successful application of these kind of tools is the quality of the metocean forcing, uh, wind, currents, ocean variables that we use to run our models and to apply uh, our tools. Then uh, we need uh, specifically in, in local areas, in estuaries, in bays, in harbors, we need uh, high resolution information, we need uh, uh, data, uh, accurate uh, currents, accurate uh, ocean uh, data to provide uh, and to be confident with the information that, uh, that, uh, that we provide to the end users. Then the role of Copernicus and the role of the national provider that provide us with this uh, high quality data that we need to develop uh, our systems is very important because uh, sometimes we have uh, many problems when we want to develop something for the end user, for the, for the stakeholder, then to have this information, this high quality information is, is the most important. Okay, and what's needed to have that kind of high quality information, do you think? Uh, we could need uh, the coastal area is the, the, the is the the area that we need uh, is the challenge i think because we have uh, many data offshore but uh, we need we need more information in, uh, in 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 coastal in local areas i think that also we also need uh, in situ measurements this is very important for us because uh, we need to validate our models we need to be confident uh, in our results and then uh, the the measurements are really scarce. Are really scarce. Then I would I, I think that we need uh, uh, data for validation, measures, and, and information in the in the local areas. Yes. Okay. Great. Thank you very much for that, Anna. Actually, we have another question. I think again, it's for you, Vincent Henri uh, from Slido. Um, our attendee wants to know what is the reliability of methane measurements with Copernicus. Methane measurement is, is uh, one of the big successes of, uh, of Copernicus uh, with the uh, satellite that I mentioned already, Sentinel-5 precursor, the uh, processing by the uh, Dutch uh, Space Research Organization has allowed to uh, provide uh, uh, methane with uh, unprecedented global coverage. So in terms of precision, um, the satellite observations, even th this one, are not as good as surface-based observation. Mm -hmm. But what is essential with uh, satellite observation is that it provides a daily revisit. Uh, and if you use uh, this satellite in combination with surface-based observation with a numerical model, you can really uh, get more insight on methane observation. And that's exactly what we've done in the uh, Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service. We have uh, an operational system which is looking at incoming observation from a Sentinel-5 precursor and detecting automatically uh, with an artificial intelligence uh, system whether the emission, the quantity of methane in the atmosphere are, uh, are uh, what we expect them to be. 
And with this system, we've been able to uh, identify potential uh, leaks of uh, methane, and then which can be followed up with uh, other types of, uh, of, of sensors. So it's the satellites are really essential. They are bringing uh, information, but it's part of a bigger system that in the end brings uh, the answer to the uh, policymakers, or in, in that case also to the operators of uh, methane uh, extraction. Okay, great. Um, Hans, I, I just saw that you wanted to come in um, on another question. I don't know now if it's been um, answered, but there is a question in for you. What opportunities do you see for the new proposed Copernicus Sentinel missions to contribute to the zero pollution policy objectives? Well, I, I think there is a great opportunity there again. Huh? One, of, one of the elements, of course, will be that we have much better uh, surface temperature uh, measurements and and that can be very helpful in terms of zero pollution because uh, that can be a, a an indicator in a modeling approach uh, uh, of, of uh, ecosystem loss for example yeah? uh, of uh, yeah the, the loss of biodiversity in soil soil quality but it can also be used in urban contexts uh, urban heat islands uh, for example uh, that have a, a major impact uh, during heat waves on the health uh, in a number of uh, cities. Uh, think of the heat waves that we had uh, two years ago, uh, but also a, a number of years ago in Paris. So it, it, it can be used in a variety of ways uh, that can be linked to human health, but also to the quality of the environment and, and also to other data that we focus on with uh, more traditional pollution uh, oriented understanding. But again, the, the trick or the trick, the key is integration into existing knowledge systems and making the full use of the potential of this new type of data, which is often more frequent, which has a different granularity, which allows us to make connections that were not there before because we were measuring based on uh, yeah, delineations that were more political or, or, or more administrative. So all of those elements can contribute and, and clearly the potential also of the next uh, missions uh, can be fully used in that context. We're nearly uh, coming to a close, but Laurence, I think a similar question directed to you, the same thing very quickly. Um, can you give us your views on the proposed new Copernicus Sentinel missions? Yeah, so indeed, the, the next Sentinel are going to be key to uh, continue, actually, uh, the service we are making. I mean, it, is to, it needs to be a sustained service. Uh, this is the first thing that we need to do. So we need to keep distributing the same data and the same quality of data that we are doing right now. So this is really quality control. This is really state of the art data. And we are basically, this is the base da data in the world, basically. So we really need to keep doing that. And this is only uh, thanks to the future sentinels that we are going to be able to do that. And uh, coastal is also the key. I mean, as uh, Anna was saying, coastal data uh, needs to be provided. And we really need to have uh, higher resolution products. Uh, so this is, yeah, this is a future better quality, higher resolution, and a sustained service. Okay, well, on that very positive note, I leave uh, the discussion. We've run out of time, and I don't want to delay um, the future panel sessions that are happening uh, straight away. A big, big thanks to all of you who joined us for your time contributing your addresses and the work that you put into making uh, your talks today. Really, really appreciate it. So a big virtual thanks to you all, and thank you to, to the European Commission for organizing this particular session and to those who worked backstage to put it all together as well. And by the way, if you want any more information on Copernicus, go to the copernicus.eu website. And I think too, they have an events page dedicated there to answering your questions. So enjoy the rest of EU Green Week 2021. I'll leave you now and hope to see you again in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you.